there's kind of just a moment that occurs where everyone says, no, we can't take this anymore. And the community just comes together and starts fighting that this one event triggered patients to actually come together. And they started coming together in town halls, local politicians got involved, the media got involved. There's a real community push to get these two entities to start working together, which they actually did. They, you know, Go be doing podcast. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure. I, I saw your film, which is well. Tell everybody the name of your film and give me the elevator speech. I've never heard about it. What what have you captured in this ninety minutes? Yeah. So uh, the documentary it's a documentary feature film, and it's called Inhospitable, and it looks at the ways that hospitals uh, are driving up our healthcare costs. That's just the the. Well, one liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what we do in the film is we're looking at the ways that hospital consolidation and a lot of um, you know issues around hospitals are driving up prices, but also affecting communities and patients and workers. That's great. Yeah. So what's important, I think, about this conversation is everybody out there right now. Well, <laughs> stuff has maybe changed a little bit with COVID, but mm-hmm. for years the pharmaceutical companies were our worst enemies, right? And then you know that has maybe changed a little bit in the hearts of people, but people still can see, can see that like when a pharmaceutical, let's say the CEO of Moderna or something, they just got paid out 900 million or something for their work on the vaccines. You know, people still see that as like, God, something sounds wrong about that. These are supposed to be public health safety measures or whatever. And then they also look at salaries of physicians and they, they see the whole system as just this corrupt profit driven thing, which I actually think it probably is in a lot of regards, but people forget Oh, and not to mention the insurance companies, but people forget about the role of hospitals in this conversation, which is exactly why I think your film is so critical, that it's not just these, these uh, common enemies. There's also the hospital systems themselves have a, a big role in driving up prices. And your film focuses on the Pittsburgh area, correct? Yep. yep. Yeah. So the, the large uh, healthcare system there, it's called UPMC, which used to stand for University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, but now they're unaffiliated. So it just is UPMC. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. UPMC. Everybody thinks this is an academic hospital system. They are teaching some of the brightest minds. They've, they're doing it all out of the goodness of their hearts. They are a nonprofit, which, yep. is a, which is an important part of the conversation because until recently, Jeffrey Romoff, who was the CEO I think he stepped down a couple of years ago, maybe in last year, I think. Yeah. 2021. Okay. So he was making roughly $10 million a year at a nonprofit hospital system. And the sort of crux of the conversation is who cares that people are making money? Who cares that there are these big hospitals that are driving up prices? However, any competitors in the market are being squelched at the cost of the people seeking care within the hospitals of Western PA, which is actually not just UPMC's domain anymore. Doesn't UPMC have something like, I want to say there's something like 20 to 25 hospitals worldwide, but they're all over the region now, right? Yeah, I think they have one in Italy. But I think that that's yeah. that what you just said is, is the point. You know, we in this country, you know, as a society have decided that we want private businesses to run our healthcare, right? So if that's the argument, then and if it's like you know capitalistic system sure. you know let yeah. the market let the market decide <laughs> yeah exactly so if that's the case then we have to you know the, but the the problem is the market is not deciding right we're we're getting to these large large um, monopolies uh, that are driving out all competition and basically you know the experts say in the film that the hospitals are able to charge very high prices because there's just no competitors so yeah. It, yeah. it's kind of like you know, you, they have it both ways at the moment. And on top of that, they don't pay taxes, right? Yeah. right? Most of them, I can't say they, but yeah, the majority of hospitals in the U.S. are nonprofit charities and do not pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a problem. And in, in uh, <laughs> having been a, a I, I told you this right before we started recording, but I was born in Bethel Park, which is just south of Pittsburgh. It's one of those very white middle-class suburbs. And uh, my mom worked as an executive administrator at UPMC. Hmm. She was paid, her salary was in part paid for by the um, University of Pittsburgh Physicians, which is a private group of physicians that is contracted by UPMC, this megalithic giant, in, in literally and figuratively in Western PA, hmm. 
<laughs> and when I told her about the film, she was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's what's happening. Like, I mean, she, she had thought about it, but um, when you when you say UPMC to Pittsburghers, it's very confronting because UPMC is everywhere. They're on, mm-hmm. if you go into the airport, they have an entire mural down the 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 main drag of UPMC. Yeah, we filmed and they... it. It's in the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So watching your film was also a little bit nostalgic, but it was also like, man, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, they're so inextricably tw- entwined, the economics of the Pittsburgh region and this yeah. m- giant business, which is UPMC. Yeah. So you're from Southern Florida, right? You're living in yeah. Southern Florida. Tell me about why did you choose this project? Yeah, well, I'll also just to to speak to what you were saying, it's also conflicting, it's confronting and conflicting, right? Because UPMC, people love the service that they get there if they can get it, right? If they, they can, can access it. it. Yeah. But, you know, they do have top quality medical care that they're providing. They have groundbreaking this and that or whatever. And so it's it's not that people are complaining about the the quality of the services. It's really about the cost and the access. That, yeah. That's the big question. Um, but that's, I think that's when you were talking about insurance companies and pharmaceuticals, I mean, they're such easy villains, right? But hospitals are tough because that's where I had my baby. That's the yeah. doctor that saved my father's life. You know, it, we're, we're really connected to the doctors and the people that are actually physically helping us sure. and saving our lives. Sure. So it's not as, as, as a difficult, it's not as easy as a target as saying, yeah, yeah insurance companies, you know, yeah, they're just totally. taking all my money or whatever. Um, but how did I get interested? You know, there's no, it's no secret that we have um, a broken healthcare system in this country. And, you know, you hear, as you say, you know, you, you watch the presidential debates, both Republican and Democrat, and you hear, you know, insurance companies, and big pharma, and, but you don't hear hospitals. Um, yeah. I, I had to kind of dig pretty deep to find some mention of hospital um, in, in those debates. So there's just no mention of it. And, and I wanted to know why, and it turns out that it's, it's really not, it's, it's a, it's, it, it's a, a bipartisan question, right? Because on both sides, you're not really hearing anybody talking about it. And, and realistically now I know, you know, hospitals are contributing to all parties because <laughs> they have yeah. a lot of power. Um, so for me, it was just trying to figure out, okay, what's hospitals role here? And as I started digging and digging and digging and, and, and learning about this, I just kept, you know, becoming more shocked that more of us don't know about what's happening with hospitals, especially because even if you're not a patient at a hospital and you're relatively healthy, a lot of the stuff that's going on with the nonprofits and not paying property taxes, it's affecting the communities, right? You have UPMC that takes up, like you say, you can drive anywhere, you turn the corner, there's a UPMC building, there's a UPMC sign. So all of those properties have been taken off the tax roll, right? Every time UPMC builds, buys a, a, you know, a new lot and builds a building that takes it off the tax rolls. So you have a public school across the street from a gleaming, beautiful building with marble lobbies and sculptures that's crumbling and rat infested, you know, the the school across the street, the public school, because they're not getting enough funding because the, 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 the city or the county is not able to, you know, raise that much money in taxes. So it's a problem that actually is affecting everybody, even if you're not, you know, a hospital patient, which eventually I think you could argue most of us will be at some point, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and to, I want to get into this battle because there's these two major medical systems. I actually trained at Allegheny General or Allegheny, it's called Allegheny Health Network now, mm-hmm. which is actually sort of linked with the Highmark system because they were really supporting the Highmark patients when UPMC developed their own insurance model, right? Yeah. And started trying to just monopolize the region, which they've largely done. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this battle between these two insurance companies, which are sort of inextricably linked with separate healthcare systems, the UPMC being far greater in their their market share, I think, over over Highmark. Although I don't really know what, even if it was 50-50, there is a, it's going to eventually be tipping that direction. So this, you brought up this lawsuit that the that was brought to the, the Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania, I presume, or was it of Allegheny County? Yeah, no, it was um, it was the state of Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who's now running for governor. Um, he that's where I've heard is, that name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he um, 
he was, that's how I found out about the story because in February of 2019, he announced that he was suing UPMC, which through my research, I realized was incredibly rare for mm. a public official to take on such a powerful entity that's so yeah. entrenched in the community and is, you know, on paper, a charity and doing all these wonderful things. Um, so it's not an easy target for a politician to take on. And he did. So that was really interesting to me. So I started tracking that story and started reaching out to local organizations and advocates, patient advocates who were working with patients. But yeah, what was going on in Pittsburgh, and it's super complicated. And I actually, we actually, in the film, we have a three minute <laughs> animated piece that's yeah. just explaining this battle but you know basically it was you know UPMC is the the dominant uh health medical provider and uh Highmark is the dominant insurer in the region and so UPMC decided to get its own healthcare you know insurance company so that they could do both and so w- you know, Highmark was really concerned about that because that was going to raise their prices if UPMC all of a sudden, you know, was could charge whatever they wanted sure. because they had their own insurance company. So then Highmark's to to add competition to the region started their own medical provider, you know, which you're, you're saying is called uh, Allegheny Health Network. And so they, it's basically this battle of Coke and Pepsi, and they're just battling out for market share. And they're just, you know, <laughs> in the film, we have two buildings literally beating each other up. Yeah, you know? it's an awesome um, graphic. I love that part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, um, so, but, but the, you know, the issue is that, you know, it's not Coke and Pepsi and it's not just soft drinks, right? It's literal people's lives who were in the balance of uh, between the, this competition of these two giants. And on top of that, they are nonprofits. So their, their main mission, right. For any nonprofit in this country is to benefit the community. Right. So, which they absolutely were not doing. And so what was ended up happening was that they UPMC decided, okay, well, we're going to shut you out. I'm, I'm doing like a very simplified version here, but yeah, you know, UPMC yeah, yeah, yeah. said, Okay, hi Mark. Uh, your your insured clients are no longer able to come to UPMC, hmm. and so um, you know they were the dominant you know insurer provider in the region. So that was shutting out people who are in the middle of their cancer treatment, people who are middle in the middle of like very very complicated heart Pregnancies. conditions, heart conditions. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pregnancy, heart condition, stuff. like yeah. literally just. Choom. No more health care. Yeah. 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 So, um, and so they had the option of going to Highmark's, you know, medical provider, which was Allegheny Health Network, but they weren't providing the specialized care that, that the folks needed um, right. at, at the UPMC systems. Cause UPMC had all, has all these very specialized hospitals. Um, and one of them is a, a top cancer hospital in the country. So Anyway, so there was that battle. And so I think what happened with with the story, and we just kind of were in the right place at the right time for the film, because this never really happens in healthcare where there's kind of just a moment that occurs where everyone says, no, we can't take this anymore. And the community just comes together and starts fighting. It feels like it's like the death of a thousand cuts with healthcare because we're all kind of in our you know, bubbles dealing with our high medical bills and figuring out, you know, how are we going to pay for our food and our rent? And also these bills, but we're all kind of in our own little bubbles. But what happened here is that this one event triggered patients to actually come together and they started coming together in town halls, which we, you know, we have footage of in the film and uh, local politicians got involved, the media got involved. And there's a real community push to get these two entities to start working together, which they actually did. They you know, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, I think actually, yeah, th- there is a bit of a resolution at the end, but I'm not so sure it's going to be resolved completely. I, there's some very bad blood there. And I, yeah, I will it's not say, a long-term solution for sure. <laughs> no. And there's also like a set period of time that they agreed to yeah. work together, right? Like five yeah. years or 10 years or well, something. Well, it was 10 years, so, but that was in 2019. So. Yeah. So know, we're, we're coming up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we're coming up in a couple of years then on a, a rehashing of this whole thing. Yeah. So it was a we'll temporary a solution, two. but. Yeah. At the time, for those particular patients who were needing that that care immediately, it was a win. But for the community, it, it was just a delay. I want to I want to talk a little bit about what you found as the actual drivers of care in hospitals. But first, I also want to share two things. One is that this this bad blood runs quite deep, even into medical education. There's a family friend of mine who's finishing medical school, and he's now applying to orthopedic surgery programs. 
if he applies to Allegheny Health Network or Allegheny General Hospital, they have a big orthopedic program, a very good one, actually. And I have a couple of friends that I went to med school who ended up there and are like in prestigious positions everywhere. But they won't get a job if they did their residency at Allegheny General working for UPMC's <laughs> incredible department. Right. So there's this funny little thing amongst the older attendings wow. there where yeah. it's like, yeah, you were trained at, at those guys and we know that you stink. So, huh. and, and so it, 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 it's not really directly related to patient care, but, but the, this blood is this, it's a uh, whole ecosystem. It's a yeah. whole ecosystem. Yeah. Where there is just bat, there's just mud being slung left and right. So, yeah. so the other thing I wanted to share is that these are two nonprofit hospital systems. In fact, most of the hospitals in the United States are actually nonprofits. Right. The difference is, as a physician, is I wouldn't be working for a nonprofit. I would be contracted privately through, like, sure. University of Pittsburgh Physicians. The same goes for Kaiser. Did you guys look at Kaiser by any chance in the film? I we, can't remember. Um, we didn't. I did, you know, uh, for my research. And yeah. I certainly asked all the experts we interviewed in the film. I certainly asked them about Kaiser. We we were thinking about including them, but we ended up not. Um, it was something that a lot of the expert, experts pointed to as as a pretty well- organized system that was yeah. working in terms of the checks and balances of having your own insurance company and being the medical provider. Right. But, but at the same time, the workers are, are, you know, they're protesting and they're striking. So it's not a perfect system either. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So I did my residency at Kaiser and I was there for four years, very hard years in the beautiful Los Angeles. I was in Hollywood. It was an awesome gig because I get to walk outside and go to the beach and surf when I was off and didn't happen very often. But when I was able to, we, we'd go and, and, uh, Kaiser is also, you know, famously one of the best providers of, of, uh, let's just call it population healthcare. And being in LA County, you would have to, you have to wonder like, gosh, if they're a nonprofit, they're probably doing quite a bit for the community. And if you go to LA now, especially after the three years of COVID, there is more homeless there. There's as many homeless there as you used to see in like the Bay Area. So we have these tent cities have, that have grown, et cetera. And I was looking at, at the, you know, uh, the head of Kaiser, what's his name? Gosh. Well, anyways, he's making something like, oh, here it is. Uh, Bernard Tyson. Um, yeah, I think in 2018. he passed, actually. Yeah, he passed, he, though. He, he passed away or he stepped down? I think he passed away. Okay. Well, he was making $18 million in 2018. So to your point about this school with the rats and the much in need of renovations in the Pittsburgh public school system, which my sister was actually a teacher there, it was hard. Like, they couldn't get money for anything. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you consider across the street from this incredibly beautiful Kaiser building that I did my training at. There is human feces on the ground. There are people mm -hmm. slumped on the side and we're stepping over them yeah. to get to our cars. Like yeah. it, it is confronting. And when you actually look at it from even just a thousand feet away, you're like, huh, you guys are a nonprofit. And like, there is squalor all over on the campus. I mean, like it was just hard to believe. And then you consider the CEO is making $18 million a year. Couldn't Kaiser have come up with a better structuring in order to be better serving the community. And it's not really, I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm just trying to get people to appreciate what I was able to see. And I don't think it's very, very different in, um, in Pittsburgh. You know, there's, there's something like 12 hospitals in LA County that are part of the Kaiser system. And, you know, it just makes you wonder like, what is the role of a hospital? Is the hospital a place to care for the community or is a hospital meant to be driven by profits through the, you know, let the market decide? I don't know if there's a right answer to that. Right. But what right. I do know is $18 million whenever people in the streets that most need your care can't even afford a bite to eat, doesn't, something doesn't add up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, some of the, arg the, there are arguments that say, you know, the hospitals should just focus on medical care and that's yeah. what they're good at. That's what they're specialized at. And that's what they should focus on. But if that's the case, then they should pay taxes, pay taxes and allow yeah. the, the, the city and the community to decide what they need to do with that money and how to, how, to, how that money can benefit the community. You know, I, I do think it's, it's a lot to put on a hospital and say, Hey, fix a homeless problem, fix the child poverty problem, you know, but, but it's again, it's just, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it <laughs> no. both ways. Yeah. Your cake, you, your cake is delicious and you're eating it too. So <laughs> yeah, so, um, actually re since the film was completed, there was a study that came out that we've been promoting on our social media that, at, that compared the, the, um, the community care and, and the community payments 
that nonprofits were providing compared to for profits. And it was the same and sometimes less because for profits also have to provide community care. Um, You know, this is explained in the film, but if, if you don't have insurance and you walk into an emergency room and it's a private hospital that, I mean, well, sorry, you know, non a a for-profit hospital yeah yeah then um they have to provide the care right right? they can't turn you away um so the for-profits also um provide a lot of community if and free care and charity care to anyone who needs it who comes in who who needs care so um another thing that nonprofits will claim is one of their um you know the things that they do to provide the for the community and why and why they should justify their their tax status is training of their staff. Well, yeah. for profits have to train their staff too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So there's a lot of things that that they're claiming on their tax forms uh, to justify their tax status, which is that is also being done by for profit hospitals. So they're they're really not justifying it, and you know. UPMC, I think at this point will say they're they're they have a million dollars in charity care to, to the community, and that kind of sounds like a lot, but um, it's also how are you defining what is yeah. charity care? Um, so once you kind of lop off the 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 free care that you give to people that come in, that for profits also have to as well, and you know anything else that you claim like training your staff, it, it doesn't leave a lot for the actual community and, and the money yeah. that's, that's going to benefit the community. Yeah, totally. Well, let's talk and, about, and I'll just add one more yeah, thing. Go ahead. There's no system in place right now, statewide or nationally, that's holding them accountable for that. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, I mean, you know, we interviewed Chuck Grassley, who at the time was the head of the Senate finance committee and he was throwing his hands up and he was very frustrated because he was, he was kind of going to the IRS and saying, you know, you're not, you're not, you're just looking at these forms and check and saying, okay, here's your tax status. You're, you're not actually looking to see if they're, and IRS was coming back saying, well, we don't have the resources for that. You know, these are That's multi-billion a separate dollar, question. Yeah. 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 These are multi-billion dollar industries, but again, it kind of comes back to, they probably should just pay taxes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, right. that's the conclusion I kept coming back to over and over again. Well, like, especially if by taxation, that's the only way that we can provide the much needed services for the poor, the houseless, et cetera. So if we're going to say taxes are important and we have tax dollars to pay for those services, then who's going to pay those taxes? Yes, the people, but also these giant businesses that are paying their CEOs 10 million, period. I mean, it just seems kind of nonsensical, but. I know it's far more complicated than we're making it sound right now. So healthcare economics of the world of economics is probably one of the most mischievous and the most uh, um, convoluted that I've ever tried to study. And I have studied it quite a bit. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's very, very hard to apply a basic, basic principles of economics to the provision sure. of healthcare. So it's, it's really, it's really not, a, not a, a black and white answer for me either. So. There was a, uh, you mentioned, just for anybody who's curious, when you walk into a, into a, a hospital, um, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which was part of the COBRA Act back in 1986, that's actually what you were referring to. It doesn't mean that that person's necessarily going to walk out without having to pay anything. In fact, if you have a mailing address, they're going to probably send you an itemized list of everything that you needed to, you know, need to come up with in order to justify, even if a portion of it was through charity, oftentimes they're still receiving bills. Can you talk a little bit about- Yeah, thank, what... you, for, thank you for making that point because yeah. that's very important. <laughs> yeah. The, the care is provided. We saved your life and you still have to yeah. pay us, um, right. which I remember when I was in residency, people would come in and one of our attendings was like, yeah, I think they were like somehow affiliated with the, the bean counters and someone. He was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that we could just chalk this one up to a charity case. And I didn't know what that uh, that meant. I was like, what do you mean a charity case? Like we're a hospital, we, we take care of people. But this is actually what they were referring to is that Kaiser only gives out so much money towards charity care and the rest they're gonna recoup by billing anybody who has any any asset worth anything. So it's, yeah. it's a problem, especially for the lower middle class because they do have some assets. They do have a home mailing address. They're maybe working right. three jobs. And yeah. now they're broke and bankrupt uh, yeah. because of these. I mean, I would bills. argue middle class at this point. Too. Oh, you're, you're, that's a <laughs> touche, touche. Yeah, yeah, we have a such a huge inequality gap in our country now. Um, yeah. Let's talk about in your research. What did you find were the primary drivers of hospital hospitalization costs? 
like who's actually deciding these costs or why is it, why are, how is UPMC actually driving up the cost, practically speaking? Um, you know, I, that's definitely out of my range of expertise. I can certainly connect you to, um, I mean, I have, you know, different answers to that, but I, I don't feel like I can speak to that in a, in a very kind of holistic way. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what I found just as a documentary filmmaker, not as a healthcare policy expert or anything like that is, um, there's just, it's shrouded in a lot of mystery. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a it's, black it's box. Actually, yeah. It's actually very unclear. Um, and you know, all these studies that have come out now where you go to one hospital and, you know, they'll charge you 60,000 for a C-section and you go to the hospital, you know, two counties down and it will be 15,000. So it, it is, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. In, in terms, as far as what's driving hospital price, hospital prices, right. Um, that the main thing that, that we found and all the, the experts that we interviewed in the film is is hospital consolidation, right? Yeah. So it's when um, hospitals are, uh, the healthcare systems are buying up all the local hospitals and creating a monopoly and as well as the physician system, right? They're gobbling up all the physicians groups as well, um, which is something we really want to go further down into in the film, but we just kind of did a little snippet. Um, we had a, a larger piece that was cut, but it just didn't make it into the film. But the way that physicians are squeezed and, and actually, um, one of our interviewees was telling stories about, you know, be, you know, these physicians being threatened, you know, completely that they will be shut out of the hospital if they didn't, you know, join up, um, and sell their practices. So, um, that feels, uh, there's a lot of predatory behavior again, on not for, of, of, uh, you know, nonprofit the hospitals that were doing this work. But yeah, that, that was basically the, the main crux of the argument. I mean, it, it's basic economics, right? Um, you know, if you have a monopoly, you can charge what you want. And, you know, the insurance companies don't, don't really have much of a say. I mean, the companies can say, okay, no, we won't pay you those prices. But, you know, people need their care. And so yeah. what are you going to do? You yeah. Know? Yeah. I, you know, what? something that was coming to me in order to illustrate, when I started diving into healthcare economics, and I was going into palliative care and hospice, which is actually a more quality-driven specialty versus a surgical specialty like OBGYN, where you you actually have a dollar amount associated with every procedure and billing code and all that. For palliative care, I'm not really doing anything. How do you how do you bill for one hour of holding space as a family copes with a new cancer diagnosis? It's not as, you know. Um, what do we have? Like the CPT codes is really how we would justify our benefit to patients. And you don't have a CPT code for an hour spent counseling family on the realities of sure. the risk benefits alternatives to chemo, for example. So when I got into the quality versus quantity world, I found this great video um, that everybody should check out. You probably saw this as well. It was by a guy named, um, he has like a, a comedy channel on YouTube, Adam Ruins Everything. Have you seen uh -huh. the video yeah. on... Yeah, yeah, so I will we'll link that in the show, but it really does give you a great it's it's a comedic satire. Uh yeah. they walk into a hospital and, and and he's trying to advise like here's why the co it costs this amount and it just gets more and more complicated as you go yeah. through the hospital. You can't even explain it. <laughs> yeah, and at the end yeah. she's like, "Uh, okay." And she, her name's called at the waiting room waiting window and she goes in to to see the doctor. So it's uh it's quite we're not going to get to the bottom of this in this conversation but I do want to impress upon people just how complicated it is and I want to bring up um I think you did a fine job of answering that I know that you're not a healthcare economist or policy analyst or anything but if you go to the hospital let's say to have a baby and let's say you walk in and you want to pay in cash generally speaking the insurance companies in the hospitals are negotiating a price right so you might find out one price over here at this hospital one price at this hospital and it's going to vary even by hospital depending on which insurance, you know, plan you have. So let's say that, you know, you go into the hospital, you show your insurance card, the hospital is going to say to the insurance company, Hey, we took care of your, your client here. You owe us five grand. Well, the insurance company might say, well, we're only going to give you 2,500. So the, it's actually, it actually is, is a, there's a, an incentive on the, on the, the side of the hospital to charge in excess for the price of the, the you know, goods and services provided so that they can recoup as much of the actual costs in order to also get a profit. Now, that doesn't mean that they're making 500% you know, profit. Maybe they are, but in many cases, yeah. they want to make some profit. Yeah. 
So if you actually go in and you want to pay with cash and you ask for an itemized list of what was done, the prices associated with those things are sometimes uh, shocking. <laughs> yeah. So like blood chemistries, I just pulled up a bill here online and it was like blood chemistries cost this person. Uh, blood chemistries would be like, we're going to do blood work every day, right? So for a three-day hospital yeah. stay, $1,400 to draw your blood yeah. and send it to the lab when you may have not even said, yeah, can we do that? Like you didn't get the, right. the option to choose from the menu of what you want and don't want, which is fine. Right. You maybe don't know what you don't want and don't want. The point yeah. being that if you looked at the itemized list, you'd be like, how on earth did that box of Cheerios cost you $20? Right. So that's a part of this. Do you, is that the primary driver as to how these hospital systems are, are maximizing profits just by trying to overcharge the insurance company, sometimes at the cost of the patient, maybe inadvertently? And there's two points that are interesting, and I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but I wanted to bring them up. One is um, that's also a way around, you know, claiming so much more in hospital costs. You say, mm. um, you know, someone came in. Um, for a procedure, the procedure cost $20,000 when like, that's just kind of a made up number. And then they said, but they could only pay, you know, X amount because they're low income. So the difference was the dirty care, but it, but that number is just based on nothing. It's not based on actual costs. It's just based on a number that they came up with that it's like, okay, that's what this is going to cost. So that that's another issue is like a lot of these numbers just aren't real. And so it's, it's just hard because they're claiming a loss, you know, for certain procedures or certain you right. know patients, but we just don't know. And, and then the other thing, um, there's a second point that, um, which was, I, you know, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to, to really know because nobody from the hospital, you know, and, and, you know, the hospital groups, the, even the, the, you know, the main lobby group, the, the American hospital association, they wouldn't talk to me, not even on record, right. Off record. So it's just hard for me to actually know what's happening internally and, and why they're doing certain things. And yeah, yeah. I just don't know. <laughs> I just know, I just know what the effects are on, on the patients. You know, I wonder if, I wonder if maybe, uh, maybe you could put me in touch with somebody that you've met along the way. That might be a another additional deep dive into some of the costs that we're actually talking about. I, I do recall, you know, when people come to me for care, I do all out of pocket now. I don't work with insurance companies or medical administ you know, hospital administrators. I do my own thing. And people are like, man, it's, it's going to be expensive to hire somebody and pay out of pocket. But when you consider actually even how health insurance works in our nation, you may or may not know this, but it's, it's actually not even something to be known. It's just the reality of being a U.S. citizen. You pay your taxes for health care, which covers Medicare, Medicaid for the most part. You pay your co-payments. You pay your monthly premium out of your paycheck without even thinking about it. It's 200 bucks a month or whatever. And then um, and unless you have a, you know, a really, really high premium, low deductible plan. But regardless, you pay a deductible and all of those payments have to, you know, come out of your pocket before your insurance even kicks in. So the cost of healthcare is even absconded by the insurance, the, the, the methods of employer-based insurance. Not to say that that's a wrong way to do it. I just don't think anybody really appreciates how much we're being charged. And that's probably why it's no surprise when people hear that we spend something like $15,000 per head per year. Yeah. for all of the U.S. citizens to have, have health care. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I remember the other thing I was going to say, which is, which is, you know, to speak to that point when I, this didn't make it on the, in the film either, but when we were talking to the city council member, uh, I think her name is Deb Gross in Pittsburgh, she was telling us that, you know, the, a lot of the UPMC workers, you know, not the higher skilled, you know, um, some of the the folks that were working in the cafeteria or whatever, a lot of them could not um, afford, were not being paid a living wage and they couldn't afford housing. And so there was a housing crisis of people just not being able to afford. So the, the city had to raise taxes on the tax paying businesses and individuals so that they can take that money and put it towards affordable housing for the employer employees of UPMC who were not being paid a living wage. Right, right. So again, it's just, you know, again, you're, you're talking about all the ways that you were paying 
paying for healthcare before even paying for yeah. a medical service is yeah. another way where you know we're, we're we're subsidizing these nonprofits in in all these little ways that you're just you don't really think about you know yeah yeah totally I I I, I just wanted to add that what was your specific, you had a question about that. <laughs> Um, do you think that that's the primary driver of hospital of of is that is that the way that hospitals are driving up costs pr- predominantly as to, as to what they're actually charging their patients? I think that was my original question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I really don't know, but um, you know, I also say you know there was something that happened you know when they passed the ACA, which again was one of those like good intentions things, and they were trying to restrict the amount of money that insurance companies would make as a profit on their, um, their customers. And, but what ended up happening was they said, okay, you can only make a certain percentage of what the, the payments are, right. That you can only make a certain percentage of profit of what the payments of your customers are. But so what ended up happening, unfortunately, is this incentivize the insurance companies. Like when you say, when you were talking about the negotiations that happened between the insurance companies and, and the providers, and they said, well, this costs 5,000 and they said, well, it costs 2,500. It's now incentivized the insurance companies to actually say, okay, you're right. It does cost 5,000. And then they just pass that on to their customers and raise the prices, you know, of the, of how much insurance costs, and then they get a higher percentage of profit. So yeah. it's, it's really messed up. It's so messed up. Yeah. <laughs> And I love the sort of candor you bring to this because this is two people who care deeply about this. We're both highly educated. We're both incredibly good at reading stuff. And for you and I, we're both still kind of like, God, this is complicated. So how is the <laughs> the, the common citizen of the United States supposed to understand this, let alone um, you know, somebody who's maybe not as literate or, or whatever else? So yeah. um, I... I a minute ago, I, I Googled real quickly to see what is the average out-of-pocket expenses for childbirth, even in um, even in the you know people who go to the hospitals. Actually, this is only looking at people in hospitals. The, uh-huh. out of, the out-of-pocket expenses can still exceed $10,000, and that is even with insurance. So right. I don't know. I mean, I'd have to dig a little deeper to see where that data came from, but it's no yeah. surprise that women are actually starting to... Do you have children, Sandra? I do. And I'll tell you, I had both of them out outside of a hospital. Okay, perfect, I have a, a three-year-old and a one-year-old and my one-year-old was born in my bathtub. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, very quickly, we had one in the hospital, the first, and then the second was at home 20 feet from here. And the first one, I'm an OBGYN, of course. So my wife was late, you know, in the early gra- you know, grappling with the, the contractions they were picking up. I was like, okay, this is definitely labor. Who knows if it's going to be two days, three days of labor? We have no idea. So let's buckle up. I made some lemonade. We lit some candles. And uh, yeah. about an hour in, she got on all fours on the ground and had her arms on the couch. And I was like, oh, no. Okay. Well, hey, honey, why don't we draw a bath upstairs? And made her a bath. And then she started rocking her hips back and forth. And I was like, honey, why don't I, let me just do a gentle exam? And she, and like, there was just a baby head in her vagina. And I was like, <laughs> okay, we're going, we're going. We got her in the car and rushed her to the hospital, but not the way you needed to, but that was her choice. That's where yeah. she wanted to be. And so, you know, sure. more power to her. But the, um, the reason I even brought this, this topic of childbirth up is that as people are choosing more and more to have home births, you look at the data and the vast majority of people who are having home births are actually paying out of pocket. So home birth under the care of a midwife is becoming, it used to always be that this is where the, the, the lower class, the, the poor, the immigrants, et cetera, were being cared yeah. for by midwives because they were desperate for some care and midwives, they're one little bastion of, of, of uh, a credibility, so to speak, sure. laid in, um, in childbirth. And, and by the way, I think midwives are some of the greatest gifts oh, yeah. to childbirth. So don't misconstrue <laughs> my words. I have- yeah, yeah. 70 episodes before this, just hailing midwives. So this is not a, a <laughs> this is just a, a, an understanding of where it used to be. And now it's yeah. actually a privileged thing to be able to pay for a home birth at home with a midwife. So sure. most midwives, you know, I've, I've got plenty of midwives I collaborate with and they're charging anywhere from three to $5,000 for the entire yeah, I think package. mine was about 5,000 and I felt like that yeah. was a, a deal. You know, yeah, because if you're getting everything. It's all included right there, yeah. apart from maybe ordering yeah, a couple but, supplies or whatever. Yeah, but I have the privilege to say that $5,000 yeah. is a deal, right? Exactly, I mean. exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, well, 
well, let's let's reconsider. Is it a deal? Like, is it truly a deal? Because if it's true that by going into the hospital, you might get hit with over $10,000 worth of bills from the moment you're diagnosed with pregnancy and they charge you for that $400 ultrasound to confirm dating or whatever, every urine dipstick, every MA that, that has their, you know, is involved in your care, every doctor visit, all of the glucola tests, all the blood work, everything, if you add it all up, you're probably paying far more out of pocket than the midwife who's got four kids of their own and is going to drive 100 miles into the desert to see you. You're probably getting a deal by actually yeah. hiring a midwife and having a home birth. Even if you don't have insurance, it's probably going to cost you more to have a hospital-based birth nowadays than it would be to be at home. So a lot of midwives are like, I, people can't afford midwife care. And it's like, they can if they understood the healthcare economics of yeah. what's actually well, happening. I was still paying for my health insurance on top of that. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah. in some ways, it's like the cheapest way to have a baby is to just scrap insurance altogether and pay for the care as you need it throughout the pregnancy, yeah. especially yeah. if you're healthy and you're low risk and all this other stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah, yes, and, but you know, then if you have a complication, you need it. You know, then you need it because otherwise, pay hundred thousand dollars out of pocket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, heaven forbid you end up in the operating room. I think I saw something like a C-section costs anywhere from eleven to thirteen thousand dollars out of pocket. I mean, that is a lot of money for a half hour of my time. And granted, it's you're not paying for the for the surgery; you're paying for the the experience that a doctor has to train and everything else and all the education. But I don't, I wouldn't be able to afford right now if you asked me to. Well, I, I could, I could find thirteen thousand dollars. But if that was the, if that ends up happening, we're in the hospital. That's this is why people go into bankruptcy. They have to get extra jobs with their newborns. They have to sell their house. They have to move into a trailer. Like this is the reality of being quote sick in the United States. And I would argue that pregnancy is not a disease, nor is birth a medical procedure. Sure, sure. So mm-hmm. if if you don't want the sick care offered by UPMC, perhaps you just pay out of pocket, and then you actually save yourself money, which is hard to wrap our heads around, but. In some cases, it actually might work out that way. Absolutely. Well, I, I had my first baby before I started working. On, well, that's not true. I started working on this in January of 2019. I was born April 2019, which also tells you how crazy I am that I was also having a baby and working on an independent <laughs> Yeah, right. You have to be every teams. woman. Yeah. And then during post-production, right, during the editing, I had my second baby. So I have two inhospitable babies. But but yeah, I, 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 I will say that certainly my experience with my research on the film informed my decision to not have the babies at the hospital. And again, you know, I was healthy and everything was, was fine, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I would, you know, as far as just um, some, you were saying it's so complicated and how does a, a regular individual, our editor of the film who obviously learned so much about this too. She's just, you know, a documentary filmmaker as well, but she recently had a procedure done at the hospital. And because of the film, she went back and negotiated her, her own bill down because it was something that we had learned but through the, the film is that, you know, if you go back and say, this is too high, this is ridiculous. I'm not paying this. I'm not even taking this to my insurance company. They'll just, they'll just knock a couple thousand dollars off of the bill, which also right. tells you how, fake the prices are where they could just say, okay, no problem. Don't even have to run it by my supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> just knock it off. I, um, I, I would, I, what, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. You're getting me excited. The other thing <laughs> that was, yeah. The other thing that I would, uh, that I always want people to say, what is it that we can do right as individuals? Um, you know, definitely the film is a lot more about inform, you know, informational and educating people on the problem. You know, we don't have a lot of time to really talk about specific solutions in the film. There's a lot of resources on our website. If you go to about the issue, so inhospitablefilm.com, if you go to uh, about the issue, there's a lot of different resources there from policy suggestions to individual, you know, uh, resources that people can do, um, you know, if, if they get, if they have these high bills, but, um, I would say, you know, Elizabeth Rosenthal, Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal, who was one of our interviewees, um, she has a book called an American sickness. And I would definitely recommend for everyone to read that because it, it does, it gives you an overview of the whole system, but it also gives like very practical things that you can do. An American Sickness, yeah, by Elizabeth Rosenthal. I just found mm-hmm. it. I will, uh, I will definitely link that in the episode. We're gonna have a lot of links for this one because, yeah, if this isn't stirring someone's pot, I, 
<laughs> maybe they're maybe this isn't the right show for them, but I I love to <laughs> to get into these black boxes where there's not a really easy answer. Um, yeah. I'm I'm also curious since you've made the film, have you found that there are similar Although situations? There is an easy answer. Hey Tess. <laughs> well, anyway, sorry, that would probably ahead. solve the that would probably solve at least some of our issues. I mean, I when I was at Kaiser, I already was interested in this. Like I was a bad boy, not a bad boy. I mean, I I I was. Uh, um, insubordinate, let's just say, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and always very curious and thoughtful since I was a little kid. In fact, I was on the phone with my mom yesterday and I was like, I was actually telling her about the interview I'm doing with you. And I was like, you know, mom, I, I, I'm glad I'm out of the system because if I kept talking like this, I'm not so sure any hospital would want to hire me. And she's like, well, you're kind of like me when I was little and we got into a conversation like that. But you know, it's for anybody out there who works in the hospital system this is what we were trained to do is to work within the hospital system. It, it's kind of going above and beyond to start asking these questions and demanding things of the CEO of Kaiser or whatever. But quite frankly, if we put 18 million, instead of you making 18 million a year, Kaiser CEO, what if you made 10 million? Could you be happy with 10 million? Where would we use the $8 million otherwise? Could we lower costs? Could we provide more charity care? I mean, obviously yeah. I'm simplifying it, but that is a pretty darn easy first step is if you're going to call yourself nonprofit, act like a nonprofit. Maybe we change the tax code a little bit. Maybe you pay some extra in taxes. We drop yeah. down the wages of the people who are not even providing clinical care. And we right. go from there. And then we 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 go into phase two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, we certainly have, we certainly focus on the CEO pay in the film too, because that is something so tangible. and something you can really get angry about. Yeah. But I think, I, I can't remember who it was, but one of the experts we were speaking to made a, a really good point that like if if i if we it's a multi billion dollar like kaiser's you know multi billion dollars right so it's like if you um or you know the, the, i mean the system is a 1 trillion dollar system right but if, if you if we're like okay um whoever the ceo of kaiser is because i don't know who it is right now but if you if we're going to pay you 18 million dollars but you're going to run an incredibly efficient company who is going to lower costs for, for the patients, who's going to provide for the community, who's going to, you know, uh, pay their workers a living wage and probably higher than a living wage um, and take care of their, their employees too. And, and, and that's all going to happen. Fine. Take yeah. 18, 18 yeah. million dollars, like whatever it costs for you to, to make a better system and what you think you deserve. Great. I, I, so that, that it's, it's such a good argument because it's like, yeah, it's, it's not really about like the number of how much they're getting. It's that they're getting this and also yeah. <laughs> all, yeah. you know, not doing the things that they should be doing. You know, it's like one of the arguments for hospital consolidation that the hospitals make all the time is you know, if we can all get on the same page, coordination of care, that all sounds great. I I would love that. I would love to be able to go to one doctor and another, and, you know, they're all talking to each other and they're on the same system. That all sounds great. And, and they're like, you know, it will have efficiency and, you know, lower our costs. Like that's always a thing, like lower our costs. And, And it does actually turn out that they are able to lower their costs. But the problem is that, that that those savings are not being passed on to the customers, right? To the patients themselves. So that's that's another thing. It's like, well, if you're going to consolidate for the reasons of being more efficient and lowering your cost, then you got to lower prices. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I so, mean, I think the conversation around profit and for uh, nonprofit and for profit is also a little bit perversed because people expect that if you're a nonprofit that there should be no profits, nobody should make any money. This should just be a collection of martyrs that are going to die on the cross for the cause, you know, the cause of whatever it is, the cause du jour. Right. And there was a really good TED Talk. I'll send it to you. It's Dan Pelota. The way we think about charity is dead wrong. Now, I don't agree with everything he says, but he's like, listen, if you're running a nonprofit, you have to think of it as a for-profit business. Otherwise, you're just scraping by every step of the way when you could yeah. utilize basic business principles with an, an earnest and compassionate heart sure. and still get people a salary that is worth worthy of them doing this incredible work mm-hmm. in boosting up their communities and whatnot. So yeah. I'm also not arguing that you know Jeffrey Romoff should make $1 a year or whatever. Like <laughs> if he's doing a good job getting people care in Western PA, give him the money he deserves. I am totally right. for that. But right. what, what you said is spot on. I mean, that's that's really where I think we can start to draw a line in the sand and say, hey guys, 
is he really worth $10 million whenever there's a, sh- a school across the street who's suffering from them not paying taxes? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Because their, ar- their argument is, well, we have to pay the CEOs competitively compared to the for profits or else we're going to lose this re- these people who know how to run businesses and we're going to be left in shambles, which is a f- that's a perfectly fine argument. But then they have to do their job. <laughs> yeah. How can people find your film and uh, maybe reach out to you if you have any questions, if they have any questions? Yeah. So we are um, we're working on distribution right now. We. Uh, we know it will be distributed. We just don't know exactly where. Um, so we, um, I think the best thing to do is uh, get on the website inhospitable.com, uh, sorry, inhospitablefilm.com and then um, join the newsletter uh, because we're, we send updates on, um, we, we're not going to you know spam your inbox, but we'll let you know the, where you can watch the film. And then also um, we have social media as well. Uh, it, we post a lot of stuff about hospitals. So if you're really interested in getting into the weeds of what's going on in the hospital system and, um, you know, policy information, but also just kind of useful practical information as well, you can, um, you know, follow us on Twitter, Inhospitable FLM. <laughs> um, that's our Twitter handle or Instagram and, and Facebook as well. Amazing. Thank you so yeah. much, Sandra. Yeah. Um, we'll Thank link so everything much. that we talked about. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for giving me yeah, some of your time. Yeah, I wish we could talk all day. This is great. I really no, you're, appreciate you're you taking the time and your interest in the film. But one, one last thing real quick. Do you have more projects around this topic coming out in the future? No, I'm currently working on a, a, a documentary project for Showtime about soccer. <laughs> oh, right on. So, okay. <laughs> so, it, so I kind of bounce around, but I, I would be interested if something else came up. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, great. Well, thanks for doing your work. Thanks yeah. for making your film. Once it's available, yeah, we'll blast so it out to everybody. Thank and I hope you. you have I appreciate a, that. Have a great this. day. Thanks. You too.